Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation entitled Coastal Dynamics, How to Effectively Model Sediment Transport. We do expect uh, the presentation to run for approximately about an hour and a half today. We will be happy to answer any questions you have. If a question comes up throughout the presentation, please feel free to write your question in the Q&A function, which you will see at the bottom of your screen at any time. And once the presentation has completed, we will be happy to answer each question. Also, we will be recording today's webinar and it will get posted up on the DHI America's YouTube channel later on and everyone will receive a link to that so they can view it in the future. Um, I would like to present today's presenter, Mr. Julio Iserman. Julio has been with DHI for many, many years and he works as a senior coastal marine scientist and has been involved in many consulting activities and also has been a key software developer within the fields of coastal sediment transport and morphology. And with that, I now hand it over to you, Julio. Thank you very much for the introduction, Barbara. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everybody, depending on which time zone in the world you are. Um, the presentation of today will mainly deal on which model to use depending on the type of sediment transport issue you are trying to solve. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the Mike Zero, Mike family of models, but it includes a large uh, number of sediment transport modules and it can be sometimes difficult to figure out, oh, which one should I pick if I have to resolve this, this task? Uh, so the MIC models include a three-dimensional flow and sediment transport model that is MIC3 FM. Uh, and the reason why FM is in brackets here is because you have two, two sets of models. The, the model based on the use of a Cartesian grid, which is a, a rectangular or square grid res to resolve the bathymetry, or a flexible mesh, which is an unstructured mesh consisting of triangular and or quadrangular elements. Now, um, I must admit this slide is a bit uh, outdated because these days the classic models are used less and less. And uh, something is going on. Oh, okay. Um, and it's the flexible mesh models that are used, mostly used these days. So perhaps the brackets shouldn't have been there. Anyways. Uh, Mike includes a three-dimensional flow and sediment transport model, Mike 3 fm which can be used for modeling transport of sand, mud, and suspended particles. I will expand on that later on. Similarly, we have Mike 21 which can also be used for the transport uh, to simulate the transport of sand, mud, and suspended particles. Uh, only using a two-dimensional modeling approach. The vertical dimension is not resolved. The flow in the vertical dimension is not resolved. It is assumed to be depth average. And then we also have a one-dimensional package, which is in, this, uh, in its modern incarnation is called the Littoral Processes FM package in the old days known as LEADPAC. And you still have to uh, use LEADPAC in some cases. I will expand on that. Um, this is a package which assumes quasi-uniform conditions for the bathymetry and the waves along the shore, and then can simply represent the bathymetry through a coastal profile that makes, makes it very computationally efficient. And this uh, literal processes package can be used to simulate the transport of sand and shingle, not mud though. 
um, a little bit uh, of overview of the greens. Um, these days we are most more and more using the flexible mesh models. And you can see the concept of a flexible mesh in these two slides. The idea is that you have triangles or quadrangular elements of different sizes to resolve the bathymetry. For example, in this case here, we have the Venice Lagoon in Italy with the three tidal inlets. And you get an impression, you get the idea that there are areas where the triangles are much smaller, that is in these darker areas. And there are other areas away from our site of interest where the triangles are larger. That allows the, that gives us the possibility to focus on areas of interest and keep the run times reasonable uh, by not resolving at high resolution areas that we do not need. Um, the 2D and 3D flexible mesh models share the same mesh in the horizontal. For the 2D model, you do not have to resolve the vertical. For the 3D model, the vertical has to be resolved. And there are two examples here, the two top figures, showing in this case a sigma or stretch vertical mesh in which the number of elements is kept constant and the height of the element changes with depth. The elements are high, higher in deeper areas and uh, thinner you may want to call in shallower areas. Now the classic model, uh, Mike 21, Mike 3, used a different approach. It used a Cartesian grid in which the bathymetry shown here in the uh, right figure on this uh, middle row is resolved through typically uh, square cells. And that gives some issues when trying to resolve boundaries. If you look, if you can see the land water line here, you will see that it looks like a staircase. And that is because the grid, uh, the cell size, the grid size is the same throughout the model. And a attempt or an option to improve on that is to use nested models in which a finer, higher resolution grid is inserted inside the outer grid and used to resolve a smaller area at a higher resolution. And that that has to be done because it could, it may, it is probably too expensive from a computational point of view to resolve the entire area of interest at the resolution of the finer uh, grid. The models run coupled and there is continuous transfer of information from one grid to the other. So you only need to worry about boundary conditions applied at the outer uh, grid. For the literal process FM model and lead pack, uh, it is, as I mentioned, 1D modeling, assuming that quasi-uniform conditions exist along the coast. That, that means there are no sudden variations in profile geometry, wave conditions, etc. So that allows to treat each profile independently from neighboring profiles. Uh, and then we only need to specify the bathymetry through the variation of bed levels along the profile, which you see here. There is a bar in the profile in this case, and you can also see the surface elevation. When you are 
selecting which model to use, uh, the selection will be to a very large extent dictated by the type of sediment. Uh, in the figures to the right, you see mud sediment on the top and sand sediment on the bottom. Mud, uh, I will start from the sand sediments. The sand sediment is uh, non-cohesive, which means that if you rub the sediment between your hands, you can dis easily disgregate it. You can see the individual grains and there is no chemical uh, bondage between the grains. So co non-cohesive sediment, and it can be sand or shingle or even coarser sediments, can be characterized by the grain size distribution of the sediment sample, the sediment density, and a median grain size, and that's all you need. Cohesive sediments of or mud are a bit are finer, are stickier. If you rub the sample in your hands, you get dirty hands, as you see in the image. And you can see that the sediment is brown, but there are like black patterns, patches, sorry, in it. That could be biological, biological um, components of the of the mud in the mud. So uh, the sediment cannot only be characterized through the grain size distribution. Other other properties are important, like uh, flocculation, uh, chemical chemical bondages, etc. So the two types of sediments are behave very different in nature. So different uh, physical processes are required to describe the sediments, and that means different models. And that is why in my 21, we have a sun transport model for non-cohesive sediment. Uh, in the MIC models in general, MIC 3 and MIC 21, sorry. And, and we also have a mud transport model for simulation of transport and morphology of cohesive sediments. And the lead pack and littoral process FM models fall within the non-cohesive sediment transport group that is sand transport or uh, shingle transport. And in the outer band of this kind of circle, you can see the applications for the different um, of the different modules. Sun transport is typical of coastal regions where the waves play an important role in hydrodynamics. The area is too active for mud to settle and so you typically will find sun-sized sediments. Mud is found in the estuaries, shelter areas, mangrove areas. So it's a different kind of environment. And there is a module here, which I haven't described, which is the particle tracking module. Both the ST sun transport and MT mud transport modules assume that the sediment is on the bed. It is picked up by the currents and sometimes combined with the waves and transported away and it can deposit in other areas. The particle tracking module and to some extent the MT module are used in cases in which sediment doesn't originate from the bed, but from higher up in the water column. And that is typically in connection with dredging and reclamation projects. You have the dredger operating, sucking sediment from the bed, 
downloading the slurry into branches and a part of that is spilled and that creates what is called a dredging plume and the way to track the dredging plume is using the particle tracking or the mud transport, mo uh, transport modules sorry and the in that case the plume may consist of a mixture of sediment sizes, uh, fine sands and mud. And of course, uh, the coarser the sediment, the closer to the source it will deposit. And um, conversely, and the model will track those fractions individually. So to sum up, um, again, based on the type of sediment, we can uh, we can use this uh, kind of table to guide our selection of of a model. And the boundary between cohesive sediment and non-cohesive sediment is a median grain size d50 of 60 microns. Sediments finer than 60 microns are considered cohesive, clay sealed. Sediments uh, coarser with a T50 coarser than 60 microns are considered non-cohesive, sand, shingle, gravel, etc. So if we have to model very fine sediment, cohesive sediment, clay sealed, very fine sand, we need to use the empty module in MIC, 20, MIC 3 or MIC 21. And that is because the empty module uh, is capable of describing the processes associated with the transport of cohesive sediment. Uh, we will see the details about that very shortly. For sand size uh, sediment, we have the ST module in MIC 321. We have a new module, a relatively new module, which is the shoreline morphology module in MI21. And we also have the littoral processes FM lead pack. If we have shingle, we unfortunately have only one option, which is littoral, the littoral processes FM lead pack a suite of models. And the particle module in MI21-3 can deal with all sorts of sediments. So, uh, when you are setting up your model, you will see that there is a module selection user interface. And that module selection interface includes the mud transport and the sand transport. And you can access that interface in two ways uh, or along, uh, through two paths. One is uh, directly through the hydrodynamic module, MIC3 or MIC21 HDFM or you can access the module selection interface. So when to use one and when to use the other? Well, the question you have to ask yourself is, do waves influence hydrodynamics and hence sediment transport? If the answer is no, because you are in a river, you are in a shelter area, you are in an area where waves are very small or negligible, then you go through to MIC 3 21 or 21 flow model FM, select your sediment transport module or modules and you set up your simulation. Now, if, you, if the waves do influence the hydrodynamics, if you are in a coastal area where 
the breaking waves drive the littoral currents that force the littoral transport, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have to access the, mo the models, the sand and mud transport modules via the coupled model FM. And that is because there is this additional entry here, which you do not see when you access the model setup through the flow model FM, which is the spectral waves. You need to specify the spectral waves to, to be able to simulate hydrodynamics and sediment transport in coastal areas where the waves are important for hydrodynamics and sediment transport. How is sun transport calculated in the MIC models? Well, in general terms, uh, sediment transport is assumed to consist of two main components, sometimes three, bed load, suspended load, and the total load is uh, calculated as the addition of the bed load plus the suspended load. In some areas, you also have wash load, which is very fine sediments, which not necessarily have a local origin, do not originate from the bed at the site, and uh, may have been in suspension for long time, long distances. And since the characteristics of those sediments do not relate to the properties of the bed sediments, the models cannot calculate them. So wash load is not accounted for. Nevertheless, a wash load uh, takes long time to settle, so it doesn't really contribute to to your siltation, sedimentation calculations. Modules uh, do calculate sun transport further if we are considering sun transport in pure current. current. Sediment transport theories, I refer to, for example, Van Rijn, Engelund Hansen, Engelund Frels, uh, Meyer, Peter and Mueller, etc. So you have a pull down menu, you pick up the sun transport formulation you want to use and, uh, and the transport rates are calculated directly. When transport of sand is calculated under combined waves and current, the situation is more complicated. Both the hydrodynamics and the sediment transport calculations become more cumbersome and more time consuming. So the way around in Mike is to first generate a sediment transport table for a range of parameters, a range of current speeds, wave heights, wave periods, wave directions relative to the current, grain sizes if you want, and store all those rates in a tabulated form. And then the model reads the sediment transport table and during calculation, it simply interpolates uh, the transport rate from the table, which makes the calculation very efficient from a computational point of view. One thing I forgot to mention here is, again, in all these calculations, the bed sediment, the non-cohesive bed sediment, the sand, 
is characterized through three parameters. Sediment density, median grain size, D50, and a parameter that we call grading coefficient, which is a measure for how, how wide or narrow the distribution of grain sizes in the granulometric curve is. That's all you need to characterize bed sediment. Now, when we are dealing with mud transport, uh, the physical processes are much more complicated. We have, as in the case with sand, bed shear stresses and turbulence that tend to put sediment into suspension. And we have gravity that tends to make the sediments to settle and fall on the bed. There, is, there are additional uh, forces acting upon the fine cohesive sediments when they are suspended. Uh, there are uh, electrostatic forces, for example, that tend to create what is called flocculation. Several grain sizes lump together because of electrostatic attraction. That does not happen in sand, but happens in mud. And the result is that even though theoretically you have a very small grain size on the bed, in suspension, if flocculation occurs, then the actual grain size is larger and so is the falling velocity, the settling velocity. When the sediment, when cohesive sediment deposits on the bed, it does in the form of weak fluid mud. It is a very, it's a, to put it in simple terms, it's a lot of water with a little bit of sediment. As time goes, the water slowly seeps out of the bed and the bed becomes more consolidated. This is the consolidation, not consolidation process. And the mud becomes fluid. And then the longer the mud stays on the bed and the, uh, the thicker the layers on top, the harder the mud on the bed becomes. And that means that also the erosion of the layers becomes more and more difficult. It is more, it is easier, relatively easy for the flow to put weak fluid mud into suspension. But if the bed has consolidated, then more uh, higher shear stresses are required in order to get resuspension. So all these processes need to be uh, accounted for by the mud transport model module, which means that when we want to characterize, when we need to characterize the cohesive sediments from the bed in the model, to provide input to the model. Now we cannot just rely on three parameters as it was the case for the sun transport model. We need to add more velocity. Uh, we need to specify settling velocity of the sediment of the individual grains. We need to describe the flocculation um, process, does it occur or not? At which concentration does it start, etc. We need to define the dry density of the bed layers that is similar to the density of the sun. We need to specify the critical shear stress for erosion for every layer. We need to provide specify the thickness of the bed layers, of individual bed layers, or estimate of 
the total amount volume of sediment in the system. And we also need to specify the concentration at open boundaries of the model. You can see that some of these uh, parameters can be measured directly, uh, but sometimes the measurements have to occur in the field. So settling velocity, flocculation. If you measure in the lab, you will get a completely different result compared to the field. Because flocculation may depend, for example, on the salinity of the water. In ch a change in salinity changes flocculation conditions. So some of these parameters are measurable, which doesn't mean they are easy to measure, and others have to be defined through experience, uh, based on experience from previous work, other people's experience, other models that were set up for the same area, etc. All this means that many, many times when you use the man transport model, you end up doing a lot of what is called sensitivity runs. So you set up your models with a set of parameters, then you change one of them a little bit upwards and downwards. For example, the critical bed shear stress for erosion. And you see how the model results change in response to that change in input parameter. And you will very, you very soon realize that the model is more sensitive to some parameters than to others, and those are the parameters you need to use to calibrate, validate your model. Mike 21, three, and to some extent, also the um, littoral process FM and lead pack modules use what we call a modular structure of calculation. It means that the mod the the the, co the packages have different modules to describe physical uh, different physical processes. You may remember the module selection interface. This is similar to the diagram I was showing in yellow and blue. I will go back to it in a second. So the reason why you see different modules here is because they all describe different physical processes. But those modules work together and transfer information from one to the other. Uh, let's assume we want to calculate littoral currents and littoral transport in the coastal zone. So as I mentioned, we need to pick up the spectral wave model, we need to pick up the hydrodynamic model and the non-cohesive sediment transport model, ST. So the wave model uses the bathymetry, read from the model mesh, and boundary data may be wind data as input, and calculates fields of radiation stresses and wave parameters, wave height, period, direction, etc., and radiation stresses. The radiation stresses are then used by the hydrodynamic model together with the same bathymetry the boundary data for the model and the wind to calculate water levels or water depth, if you want, and depth average current. And the waves from the wave model, the currents from the hydrodynamic model, together with the input data to the sediment model, are used to calculate transport rates of erosion deposition. All this transfer of information indicated by the arrows, it happens automatically. 
you don't have to do anything, you don't need to tell the hydrodynamic model that the radiation stresses are in that file, in that folder, all is done internally and seamlessly. So when you set up your model, you click the modules you are going to use, you specify each of the modules, and when you run the model, <coughs> excuse me, please, uh, when you run the model, the transfer, the information is internally transferred from module to module as needed, and you don't need to worry about that. There is one option that uh, we are using more and more, and it is once the transport rates have been calculated, we can convert them to erosion deposition, rates of erosion deposition in areas where the sediment transport rates diverge, there will be erosion in areas where they converge, there will be deposition. And we can use that information together with integration of our time to update the bed morphology. That means to create a new bathymetry different from the bathymetry that was initially specified. And then we can repeat the process. We can feed the new bathymetry to the wave model, calculate radiation stresses and waves, uh, feed the new bathymetry to the hydrodynamic model, use the radiation stresses and the boundary conditions to calculate currents, water levels, etc. Feed all that information to the sediment model, calculate new transport rates, new rates of erosion deposition, update the morphology again, and loop back. And we can do that over a user-defined period of time, and that allows us to calculate the uh, evolution of the bathymetry of the coastline. We are going to see examples uh, over time uh, for different forcing conditions given by the wave boundary data, water level boundary data, etc. So um, there are a number of models that have morphological capabilities, the ability to update the bed uh, geometry, let's call it. Uh, we have a one-line model for shoreline position, lead line, which is part of the littoral processes FM package. Uh, that simply updates, moves the shoreline forward or backward depending on accretion erosion occurring. We have a 1D model to update the crosshore profile that's called lead prof and it is in the lead pack package. That's why we still need to keep lead pack around. And then we have area models in which the full 2D bathymetry is updated, is the MIC 21.3 morph model. And we also have hybrid models that combine area models and longshore models to describe sediment transport in two dimensions, but shoreline update in one dimension. And that is the MI21 shoreline morphology model. I'm going to, I will be showing examples of this. So uh, to better, to help you better understand how the models work and, and what they do. And we are working on the development of phase resolving models. So models that are capable of calculating the sediment transport, the variation in sediment transport rates within a wave period. And those are typically used for profile update calculation. And 
my three waves is a candidate for that, but the sediment transport part is not there. So that will be coming in a later release of my of the mic software. So um, a little bit more details about longshore coastal morphological models. These models, what they do is they assume a fixed pitch profile shape and active depth that extends from the top of the dune to the closure depth where sediment transport becomes negligible. And they look at longshore gradients in sediment transport. And they convert gradients in total longshore sediment transport to changes in shoreline position in time. If more sediment enters the sail than it leaves, the shoreline will advance. And if the opposite occurs, then the shoreline will retreat. Uh, this equation can be solved in different ways. There are analytical solutions based on a Q alpha curve, a curve that relates total longshore transport to coastline orientation. A traditional one-line model which simply solve this equation, calculate the transport rates based on wave condition, coastline orientation, sediment properties, etc. Uh, plug the values into the equation and calculate the update of the coastline in time. That is lead line. And there is an, um, how to say, upgraded ver version of the one line model, which is the N line model. So this, integration is done not for the total sediment transport, but for boxes limited by different lines parallel to the coast. So the position of different depth contours are solved independently, rather than assuming a fixed shape of the beach profile. Um, this N-line models do not provide a lot of additional information compared to the one-line model, but they are a bit cumbersome to set up because a lot of information is required to set them up. So they have kind of been phased out, not used very much these days. Uh, then we have coastal evolution models. We have process-based engineering modules, models like LEADPROF, in which the transport rates are calculated along the profile are calculated, include on, including onshore and offshore transport. The gradients in sediment transport are used to update the bed. And uh, you can see an example here. The initial profile is the black line, uh, and then the final measure is the blue line, and the red line is the final calculated by the model. You can see the model does a relatively good job of finding out where the outer bar is, but there are some details it does not capture. Uh, the problem with these process-based engineering models is that they are not good for long-term simulations. The shape of the beach profile becomes very unnatural. And they are, in general terms, good at calculating profile erosion under storms event, storm events, but they are not good at calculating the recovery of the beach profile after the storm has passed. That is why behavior-based models are sometimes preferred. Uh, again, the shape of the profile is assumed and there are some rules saying how much the profile retreats or, or 
advances if the water level increases or decreases. And there is a duration, a time involved in the calculation. And this is a very stable model. You can see it has been used here over 15 years to calculate an envelope of shoreline positions. Zero is the initial shoreline position. And you can see that at some point in time, the coastline, the coastline retreats, advances, retreats, advances, etc. Something do that you cannot that easily calculate with LeadProf. And yeah, and it is a simple tool, efficient, very easy to code and very fast to run. For coastal area models, uh, you have to try to remember that block diagram that I showed you, uh, where we, we use the couple MIC 321 model uh, with the spectral waves, hydrodynamic and sediment transport modules. Different modules calculate different parameters both the hydrodynamic and spectral wave modules feed the sand transport module that calculates sediment transport rates parallel and perpendicular to the current direction. And that is used, gradients in the transport field are used to update the model bathymetry. It is a very strong tool for analyzing sediment transport patterns in complex geometries like the one shown here. Uh, this is the open sea boundary. This is the coastline. There are, you see a number of jetties along the coast. There is a tidal inlet. Uh, there is a harbor there. There are tidal channels, uh, tidal flats. So very complex geometry, but that is not a challenge for a couple model. We can take advantage of the flexible mesh to increase resolution where we need. You can see the channel, the harbor around these jetties. And we can combine quadrangular and triangular elements to resolve the mesh, the bathymetry, sorry. Here is an example. This is uh, the same place. You see the location there. This is Jutland, Peninsular Denmark. Um, uh, that's the entrance. And you can see a snapshot of the waves, currents, and sun transport calculated by Mike 21. And you can see there are a lot of details in these uh, images. But one interesting one is that, for example, there is a sea current from south to north, whereas the littoral current is from south to north in this side and from north to, side, to south on the other side of the inlet. So sediment transport is directed towards the inlet from both sides. And that is what creates the coastal erosion and the formation of the uh, of the tidal flats we see here. Okay. One example of application of my twenty one MT. This is the Basak River in Thailand. So. Again, a river mouth, a protected environment, no waves, no much sand, a lot of cohesive sediment. You can see less than 63 microns. Sometimes you also use to separate sand from, from mud instead of the 60 micron. You can see here a, a difference, what is called a difference plan, difference between two bathymetries showing areas of erosion and the position. And here you see the model results and, and you see the position is indicating, indicated in blue colors, blue and green, 
green color, erosion in red colors, and yeah, you have to look carefully to see that there are many similitudes between the two images. Uh, maybe difficult to see from the slide on your screen. Example of application of MIC 21 MT. Uh, in this case, MIC 21 MT was uh, used to to simulate the fate of dredged material. So we have the port of Esbjerg on the west coast of Jutland, Denmark. Uh, the access to the port is through this tidal inlet. The port is there. You see a close up there. And because sediments get transported into the estuary, the port needs to be dredged to maintain the water depth. And the question is, what do we do with the dredge material? Where do we dump it? And you can see here, these different panels correspond to different dumping areas. And the color scale is indicates concentration of sediments in the water column at the end of the dredging period, and also the extent of the impact zone. So dumping closer, we get higher concentrations, but a smaller footprint than dumping further away from the harbor. And now I'm going to show you an example of an application, a morphological calculation using the couple model MIC21 FM. So it says ST here because that we are transporting sand in this case, but also the spectral wave module and the hydrodynamic module are involved in the calculations. So this is a port on the west coast of Jutland, Vide Sand. And the issue with this port is that there is a very strong sediment transport from north to south, that is from left to right on your screen. The net annual transport is uh, on average 1 million cubic meters per year. So it's very difficult to keep the access channel to the harbor open. And especially after storms, what happens is that this bar moves across the entrance and after the storm uh, passes, somebody, a, ship, a vessel has to be sent to survey and figure out where the bar is how high it is and whether it is safe for, safe for the fishermen to sail out to sea again. Now, um, the color scale is in the, has been chosen this way because colors yellow, orange, or hotter are not good for navigation. Blue colors are good. You can find a similar setup to this in your uh, MIC21 installation under couple model FM examples, couple model FM Torsminde simulation one. So let's see the simulation. So you see the bar moving across the entrance, and this is a 14 day calibration period. Uh, the image is going to play and you see the bar moves, stops and moves again. And that is because there are two peaks in
if in the bathymetry surveys and also by uh, by comparing the crest elevation along the bar to the measured crest elevation. So you see at the end of the storm, I will try to stop it here. No, not very successful. You see at the end of the storm, the bar is across the entrance. There is still this area where vessels could sail out but they won't know unless somebody goes out and, and surveys. And it is a time consuming process and lips in the in hardware for too long. So the, uh, the solution which was proposed was to extend the existing breakwater, breakwater curve it, and then create a secondary breakwater like this with the idea of increasing the velocity of the currents that move from north to south in front of the entrance. So let's see how that impacts the morphology. So from then like being pushed away by the strong currents in front of the entrance. And one good thing that happens is that we see a bypass of sediment. So sediment is now being fed to the coast on the south and that coast was experiencing erosion earlier. And now with this solution, the erosion and the need for nourishment have decreased. I will let the uh, animation play one more time or so you can see it. And you see all the bed elevations in front of the entrance stay within the blue range of colors. And that means that the vessels can safely sail out after the storm without worrying about grounding on the bar. Simply the increase uh, current velocities and wave action around the entrance lower the bar in front of the entrance. You can see the bar is high here, goes down and you will see it coming up on this side, high up again. Yeah. You see there is like a depression on the top of the bar and that can be used for the vessels to sail out. And the position is exactly, you know, shoot out across the entrance and so there is no risk for the vessels to ground. Okay. Now the latest development within the field of morphological models for coastal areas coastal areas is the what we call the hybrid shoreline models or shoreline morphology models. They use a 2D mesh to compute waves, currents and sediment transport. And then the coast is divided into a number of strips perpendicular to the shoreline that you see here. And then the continuity equation is applied on each of these trips. The profile shape is assumed to be constant and then the profile is moved seaward or landwards depending on accretion or erosion occurring. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so uh, in this, this is a faster than running a full two dimensional morphological model like the two examples I showed a moment ago. And can be used in complex areas and 
the way you activate this uh, shoreline morphology module is through the couple model FM. When you go to the module selection and you select the sun transport module, this checkbox will activate shoreline morphology. You check on it and then you have to specify a number of parameters specific to the model. And uh, yeah. And let me show you some examples. This example is provided with uh, your Mic21 installation. This is a pier on piles and there is sediment transport uh, from left to, from right to left, right to left. And the a concave form over time and that process is slow and what happens is that uh, this is a popular area in Australia there are houses on the waterfront and the beach was receding and getting too close to the houses for everybody's comfort so uh, different um, different uh, Coastal protection alternatives were tested with the shoreline morphology module, and I'm going to show you a number of examples about that. So I need to click. So this is the baseline condition. If you look at, I have to click on this one as well. If you look at the arrows, they represent the current and sediment transport fields. You can see that the magnitude of the currents and thus the sediment transport increases from south to north. So this creates a longshore gradient in sediment transport and a trend towards beach erosion and recession. So what you see here is the flow field, the initial coastline is the black line, and the final position of the coastline is the red line. Now these videos uh, play a bit slower than others you saw before earlier, because they, are, they cover a longer simulation period. On the right hand side, you see how the coastline behaves if we place a shore parallel breakwater in front of the area where erosion is most critical. So you can see, I will speed this one. I will try to speed this one. Yeah, you can see in under natural conditions, if we do not do not if we do nothing, there is a trend for generalized erosion. It's maybe difficult to see, but the red line is behind the black line everywhere. And when we insert a short parallel structure, like a groin, like a breakwater, we get advanced and one advancement of the shoreline in some areas and of course a retreat in other areas. So by changing the length, the orientation, the position of the breakwater, we can control both the formation of the salient and of the erosion in the neighboring areas. 
I will leave this play a little bit more and it's and then I will move to the next one. I think this invasion is almost done for me. Yeah. So this is pretty much the conditions at the end of the simulation. If we do nothing, weak erosion everywhere, but larger around here, that's the critical spot. And if we build the breakwater, we protect that spot at the expense of erosion in other areas. Other possible, another possible solution would be to use short normal structures like a groin here or a headland, an artificial headland. And they both work in similar ways. They both block the longshore transport partly or totally, and they create accretion on the updrift side, south side, and erosion on the north side. The difference is that the headland creates, does not create separation on its lee side that you can kind of see here. And thus the impact on coastal morphology of such a structure is milder. But of course there is a cost component in building this versus that. I'm gonna let the animations play a little bit for you to see and compare the results and then we will wrap up. Let me move this to the end, like that. Like that. So you see both structures create accretion on the upstream side and erosion on the downstream side. Uh, the maximum erosion being larger for the case of the growth. 